Now, I want to do a second video to talk about 90, 91, and 92, because we spent tons of time on section 89 by itself, so I've got that there. 90, section 90 and 92 are a little more formality type things about how to organize the first presidency and how to structure certain things and, and, and do certain things. Still good information, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time on section 91. 91 is talking about the Apocrypha. So this is something that I think very few members of the church fully understand. So I want to clarify a few things here. And I want you to use this as a bit of a springboard to help you in learning more for yourself. The When the ancient writings came together into what we know as the Bible, okay, there was lots of other writings and teachings that were there as well. And so only some of them made it into the Bible. And we can go back, you can look at how King James, when he talked about it, they relied on a lot of Masoretic texts as well. But really, if you go back to around the 4th century with Constantine and uh, the establishment of uh, Alexandria, the Library of Alexandria, and all that together, they finally decided when Christianity finally became recognized with Constantine, he said, we have to figure out a way to formalize this because we have the writings of these apostles and the, the, the teachings of Jesus as other people wrote them down, which is most of what we have in the New Testament. But then because of the apostasy, there was all kinds of other churches that started to come around and all kinds of other information started coming together. And so the early, the early, in early Christianity with Constantine and the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Trent in this time frame in the fourth century, they had to come up with a way to say what is truth and what is false. So how do we draw the line in the midst of all these religious teachings that are out there? And that's what they tried to do. And I can't say they completely used revelation and sought the will of God to do this. Even some of the minutes and notes from the councils of Nicaea and Trent don't necessarily say that they used that, but more of what is expedient for us, what do we need to do, uh, because there's a lot of accusations, even that Constantine took a lot of teachings about women out of the Bible. He didn't want women to have equal stance with men. And so they took a lot of references and a lot of teachings and ideas about women out of the Bible on purpose so that it wouldn't encourage women to rise up to be equal with men. So there could be some political wranglings that got motivated into this as well, Um we do have an experience, uh, and Hugh Nibley documents this in, in some of his writings, um, about in the Council of uh, Nicaea that uh, they there's a teaching that they saw that uh, about... The, so there's, a, there's what's called the secret teachings of Jesus that really exploded during the apostasy. There were things Jesus taught his apostles, but he didn't have them teach everybody else. And most of that goes back to the 40-day ministry where the Savior taught behind closed doors to his, his apostles. Um, and there was a teaching that the Savior himself danced when they would do a prayer. And this actually, uh, according to the apocryphal writings, this happened on, the, on the, um, the eve of his crucifixion when he instituted the sacraments at the Last Supper, basically, that he gathered his apostles together to teach them, he, he kneeled down in, in the middle of them and he had them stand around him, holding one arm up to a square, holding another person next to them to their left with a specific handshake. And they were to recite this prayer and it was, it was given in an incantation type rhythmic pattern, which wasn't uncommon back then. A lot of prayers were put to some kind of a musical tone to go along with things, uh, like the monk chants that you hear of all the time. So that's what they had, and they were to repeat it and kind of dance around the circle and things. So they believe that, that uh, Jesus encouraged some dancing and in, in musical, lyrical things in prayer. And so they didn't want that. And so they decided, this isn't a good teaching. We're going to kick that out, and that's going to be bad. So realize, when you get back to the 4th century AD, so this is in the 300s AD, there, they defined what was called orthodox which was, this is what we believe the truth is, and what they call the Gnostic, which was what we don't believe in. So that's what they did, and so that's where the Catholic Church takes off with the Orthodox teachings, and then the Gnostic stuff was just kind of left to hang out. Uh, some of it were burned and destroyed. Uh, the Book of Enoch, in fact, which in old ancient Old Testament times was revered as a highly religious book, was actually seen, the Jews kicked it out, they hated it. 
by the time King David and that, you would, as the Jews were really established as a nation, they got rid of the book of Enoch because it didn't go along with what they believed as they became more of a secular religion rather than a, a religion based on faith. And as it became more secular, or some people call it rabbinical, then they kind of went away from that. And so they hated that book and got rid of it, even though they used to revere it long, long time ago, uh, because it went against what they believed at the time. And so they got rid of it. So there's this kind of challenge we have when we look at these ancient writings of what is true and what is not. And so section 91 gives us a little bit of a uh, insight to help us understand this better. They say that there are many things contained therein that are not true, which are interpolations by the hands of men. And he, Joseph was told not to worry about translating the apocryphal writings. Uh, but those who seek the Spirit and use the Spirit as a guide to help them in understanding these can gain wisdom out of them. So that's an important thing. And, and some of the apostles, I think it was Elder Hells made a comment about this, that you know you can read those uh, those books. There are There is some truth in them but you have to use the Spirit as your guide to understand that. So if you're not seeking to really have the Spirit with you a lot, uh, truly have the Spirit with you a lot, then you're going to have a hard time discerning what is truth and what is not in the Apocryphal writings. Now, I, for me, after reading Hugh Nibley's books, the Apocrypha is phenomenal. There's so many cool things out there. I've read so many great stories and understood some great things from the ancient antiquities. It is so cool. There's some great stuff out there, like the first book of Adam and Eve, was really an eye-opener, really fun stuff to read. How much of it is true? I don't know, you know. This goes back to Article of Faith 9. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. That's an important thing. And that can really apply to all writings, basically all religious writings from any philosophy, any religion, any discipline throughout all of history. We believe it is true so long as it's been translated correctly, so long as it's in, it's interpreting things properly. So that's that's an important way to look at it. Now, the Book of Mormon is very different. We believe the Book of Mormon to be true, period. It was translated through the gift and power of God, and therefore it has a more correct and perfect understanding of things than everything else. So that's one of those distinctions that we make. But realize the apocryphal is fascinating. There's a lot of great stuff there. How much of it's true and isn't, we don't 100% know but we can learn some great insights from it. So don't be discouraged against that stuff, uh, but just realize that you have to be more discerning with that and uh, to understand it better. In fact, what's fascinating, just to give you an idea, there are over 200 pages, according to Hugh Nibley, over 200 pages of writings that claim to be the secret teachings of Jesus to his apostles during his 40-day ministry in the behind closed doors when he was resurrected. He came back and met with his apostles. He taught them for 40 days. Those teachings are not in the Bible. They're not there at all. Wouldn't that be nice to have them in there? That'd be great. But there are over 200 pages of apocryphal writings that claim to be those teachings. Hugh Nibley said that he, after reading all of them, he said, if you were to compile them into one big narrative, it would read like an endowment ceremony in an LDS temple. So that'll give you an idea of what kinds of things he taught them during that 40-day ministry. Now, at the time when in the 4th century, and as the Masoretes put their text together, and future groups did that eventually result the King James Bible and those things, they got rid of all of those basically out because they didn't believe they were true or accurate. We can look back and now go, oh, because we understand a little bit more truth today, we can see they got rid of some things that were true. So just realize that those are some of the things you got to think about and, and the more you understand truth, the more you have the Spirit truly with you, then it's easier to understand what is out there. And there is so much out there, it's amazing. If you want to get in a glimpse of what is out there and what we have access to, read Hugh Nibley's book, Since Camorra. It, the whole purpose of that book is to tell you all the stuff that we have come across since the Joseph Smith went to the Camorra, Hill Camorra, and got the gold plates and started working on the Book of Mormon. There's There's been an explosion of information that we've gotten, and it's amazing stuff. And I would recommend you read it, but be discerning with it, and realize it doesn't supersede what revelations and what wisdom we've already been given from God. So thanks for following. Hopefully that helps out. Leave comments and questions if you have any. Share this with your friends, and we look forward to